So hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to this Q&A session with David Kessler, part of the Good Grief channel and co-sponsored by grief.com. I'm Liesl Dawson and I'm really delighted to be joined by grief expert David Kessler. He is the co-author of a number of books, including the classic On Grief and Grieving with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and his latest book, Finding Meaning, The Sixth Stage of Grief. He is also the founder of grief.com, which has 5 million visits from 167 countries and a lot of really wonderful resources. So before we get started, I just want to remind you about the practicalities of the webinar. So some questions have already come in and you can also type your questions into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom window. We do usually get a lot of questions so apologies if we don't get to yours. And as you've been doing, please do use the chat box to say hello and to find links to resources. And do feel free to type responses to one, another, one another's questions. And that often is really helpful, we found. Finally, just a reminder that this webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the Grief Channel. So welcome, David. It's so lovely to have you back. On I'm glad to be with you and to be with everyone today. Um, I wonder if we could start off this webinar by you talking a little bit about your both your personal and your professional experiences of grief and how the two kind of come together in your work and your life. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me. And you know, I often think about this for me wasn't a career that I chose, it sort of chose me. I grew up with a mother who was in and out of hospitals. And when I was 13, she got really sick and had to go to the hospital in the big city, which was hours away. And she was in a critical care unit. She was dying. I didn't quite realize she was dying. And at the same time, uh, at the hotel where we were, a fire broke out that then when the fire trucks pulled up, they found it was also a shooting because shots rang out. It turned out to be one of the first mass shootings in the US. So in a span of a few days, I saw this tragedy, this shooting, racially motivated shooting, and wasn't able to be with my mother when she was dying. Not unlike some of the issues that people are going through today. And it really changed the trajectory of my life. It, you know, put me on this search to try to find healing for myself and help others. So I studied death and grief and hospice and palliative care and all those aspects of it and was privileged to work with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, as you mentioned, on two books and Louise Hay and spent decades in this world of grief helping others and learning from people in grief who have been my teachers. And then a few years ago, out of the blue, my younger son, David, died at 21 years old. It was as brutal as anyone could imagine. And I found myself wanting to write a note to so many people I counseled, especially parents saying, I didn't realize how bad the pain was. And I didn't realize how hard it was. Like I had to show up in a grief group. I had to go to grief counseling. I, 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 it was enormously challenging to personally do that. So I came away. Now when people come to my grief groups, even if it's online or anything I do in person, I want to applaud them when they walk in because I get now how hard it is to show up when you're in so much pain. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I was just going to ask you next about the six elements of good grieving that I've heard you talk about before. You've sort of said there are some key things that we need to support ourselves in grief. Could you tell us a little bit about those? Sure. It's interesting. Whenever I build a group or an online course or anything or something in person, I'm always like, how can I incorporate these six elements into it. So they're always, it's almost a bit of my checklist that I go through. So here are the six elements. I'll just list them and then I'll go through them one by one. 
They are community, continued connections. Your grief does not define you. Treat yourself as your best friend. Don't compare and count your wins. So the first thing is about community. You know, we, we, we grieve as a tribe. We need our grief witness. We're not meant to be islands of grief. And the people we think will get it, like our friends and family, often are the ones who don't get it or want us to move on or get over it. So community is such an important aspect. And that actually, I was so surprised, translates online. You can have an online community. The second element is continued connections. You know, years ago in psychology, there was almost this thought of you had to complete or close that relationship with your loved one who died. And now we're seeing that actually isn't the healthiest thing to do, that a continued connection, continuing bonds with those who have died is so important and is actually quite healthy and normal. And I always say, don't give death any more power than it already has. Death has the power to end a physical life, but not to end our love and not to end a relationship. The next one is your grief does not define you. To try to also think about who is grieving? Who is the person doing the grief, doing the grief work, feeling those feelings? Who is the person in pain? You know, so many times people will say, well, I don't want to be a widow. I don't like that term widow. It's not all that I am. I'm, I'm still connected to my husband or my wife and things like that. So many times we, we allow the grief to sort of become who we are rather than what we're experiencing. And the fourth one is treat yourself as your best friend. Our self-talk is so horrible in grief. It's shocking that a moment when we could use our most compassionate voice in our head, those old protection voices often say the cruelest things to us. You know, no wonder they died or people are always leaving you or you know it's your fault. And what if instead of being your worst enemy, you treated yourself as your best friend? The fifth one is don't compare. You know, the problem with comparing is if you win, you lose. The other thing is you don't have a broken head, you have a broken heart. And when you're comparing, you've left your heart and you're in your head. And you're really sort of going through whose grief is worse? And my answer to whenever anyone asks me whose grief is worse, my response is always yours. Your grief is the worst grief. And the last one, six, is count your wins. You know, there was a big push to sort of find gratitude in grief. I think gratitude in grief can be a huge stretch. So I often talk about, especially in the first year, just count your wins. I mean, showering might be a win. Getting to work might be a win. Uh, trying to eat a little healthy might be a win. Taking a walk might be a win. So all those little wins to sort of maybe count them uh, rather than trying to go for gratitude. So those are the six I often think about. I have a, a group called Tender Hearts that's online that I made sure we built it out with those, you know, and I think many people, I'm sure, even as you do conferences and things, you'll find, oh, it's got that, it's got that, it's got that. No, it's really helpful. I think one thing that some people might do if they're feeling that they're stuck in their grief is almost to go through this, these six points and to try to work out what their struggle is, because perhaps you know, if they go through and say, okay, I do have community, I do have continuing bonds with the person I've, I've, I've lost, but, you know, I'm, I don't have self-compassion. So perhaps- right. Rule to myself, right? Yeah, yeah. So it might be a way also of kind of figuring out what they need to work on or how they need to get resilient. Yeah, let's not kid ourselves. Having community has been challenging in a pandemic. 
that's that's not an easy thing to do. Yeah, and of course, even with funerals and you know right. bringing bringing a casserole around, a lot of those things we've lost. Right. That that's really helpful. Um, we have had a lot of questions come in. Wonderful. So if, so if you're happy, um, I'll probably just start diving into them so that we okay, can great. get through more. Great. So the first one is about finding a new norm after suicide. So it starts, I would like to find hope, faith, and trust in the rest of my life. But my beautiful youngest son took his own life two years ago. And I find the grief continually overwhelms me. I was his carer and I feel his suicide was avoidable. His mental health team discharged him against my pleas to no care. Had we kept the fine balance of family care and, and MH, he probably would still be here. How can I find a new norm against that tragic fatal event? I'm trying self-compassion, but to very little effect. I expect I have to make friends with my grief and have it and live with it beside me, but it doesn't seem to give me much respite. First of all, how heartbreaking. I'm just so, so deeply sorry for the loss of your sweet son. Death by suicide is complicated and the ways we think about it are changing. The old ways were that Death by suicide was a choice, and we know that's not true. We, we now see medically um, that it is an illness of the mind, and we must treat it as such. No one who is mentally challenged could either wake up one day and go, oh, I could be mentally challenged or happy. I'll choose mentally challenged. And we know now that death by suicide is how they were trying to manage the pain. And it's a complex way to die, an issue that often leaves us with self-blame. I think it is a moment, just like you're recognizing, to find some compassion. And I can tell you, in all my decades of work, I work with people who say, I did these 10 things wrong and my loved one died by suicide. But someone else goes, I did the exact 10 things right and my loved one still died by suicide. You know, I think it's so out of our control that we look for what kind of control we might have had. And the reality is people realize that many times, even if you intervened in that moment, the problems, the illness of the mind would be there the day after. So it is such a challenging road to go. I do have a free class that you might wanna look into at suicidegrief.com, that's suicidegrief.com. And it's completely free and it's just a three part series that may help you a bit on your road. Thank you. Thanks. Um, the next question is about supporting the bereaved. Can you say the wrong thing to someone who is grieving? Well, here's what we know works best. And by the way, on grief.com, there's a whole list of the best and worst things to say. So one of the things we know is when you're in grief, you're not broken. That is what grief looks like. And we don't need to fix the person. How many people try to point out the silver linings? I always say whenever um, you start a sentence with at least, be wary, because if you're going, at least they died quickly, at least they didn't suffer, at least you don't have to care give anymore, you're often minimizing their grief. Grief is a time to really say, I don't have the right words, I don't even know what they are, but I'm here with you. Lovely. Um, we have a question about anger following a terminal diagnosis. My husband has recently been diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. I feel furious with him as I feel that he is going to die and abandon me and horribly guilty that I feel this way. How do I deal with these emotions and be there for my husband when he needs me? Such a good question. So first of all, we have to normalize anger. You know, anger is a feeling we have, but we often judge ourselves. And many times I say to people, you're judging your feelings and they'll go, no, I'm not. And I'm like, well, anytime 
you say, I'm stuck, I shouldn't be angry, I'm feeling this way, I shouldn't be sad. You are actually judging yourself that those aren't the correct feelings. And we don't realize they're such subtle judgments. So I try to help people understand anger is pain's bodyguard. Anger is a way your pain is coming out. Can we find healthy ways to just allow it to come out without hurting anyone or anything and we often weren't taught healthy ways to let anger out. Um, I have a baseball bat by my bed. You would think I'm ready for a game or ready for a burglar, but it's actually there for when I get angry. I scream in my car, I run, I've hit punching bags. I mean, it's important to get that anger out and to get those feelings out without judgment. You know, the thing is, once you feel the feeling, it will live, it's got a right to live, it will express itself, and then you'll move to the next feeling. But we often live with these half expressed feelings that just stay buried all the time. Mm, that's really helpful, thank you. We have a question about baby loss. Mm. What process would you suggest for process, processing complicated types of grief and loss, such as miscarriage? And there's a, 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 a different question, but a related question. Can you comment on the ways of supporting parents who have recently experienced a stillbirth? So you could take them one at a time. Sure, you know, we, we look at some of these griefs that we call disenfranchised or ambiguous griefs, and there are a way we minimize them. Oh, miscarriage, well, there, there, there wasn't a baby, so it's not real grief. No, it is real grief. It is real grief. And our medical world handles it horribly. Some of the wording that gets used to describe um, the baby is just really horrible. We're working on doing that better. But to realize, you know, those are true, true losses. And to understand that, you know, it takes the mother's body almost two months just to get back to its pre-pregnancy state. And we believe sort of the week after, everything should be back to normal and it's just not that way. So we so underestimate the grief of miscarriage. Uh, stillbirth, you know, I love that the medical world is changing. We're now having warming cribs and things like that in hospitals because we know Parents need a moment to parent. They need a moment to connect with that child, even if that child did not live long or didn't live at all. So that connection is so important to be honored and not sort of, you know, the old way was rush the baby out and pretend like nothing bad happened. And obviously we've come so far and hopefully don't do that anymore to allow the parents uh, time to deal with that loss. And I think to understand it affects the parents, the families, you know, as a man, I've heard from so many other men, the question they always get asked is, how's your wife? Sometimes that's asked of the grandmother, how's your daughter? And, you know, the grandmother's grief is challenging. The, the husband's grief is challenging to realize these losses affect the whole family. That's really helpful. Before I go to the next questions, I saw in the chat that someone just would like you to list the six aspects of good grief one more time. Could you just list them one more sure. time? Before Can I, I just call on? them the six elements of grief? Oh, I don't six know elements. That. Sorry. Yes. Oh, yeah, no, no, it's no, you know, I don't, I'm so careful not to judge grief as good or bad. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, but it's all good. So the elements are one, community, two, continued connections. Three, your grief does not define you. Four, treat yourself as your best friend. Five, don't compare. Six, count your wins. And these, a lot of these, we talk about them like in the most recent book I did, Finding Meaning, after my son died, those are all aspects that are in there about how do we really engage this pain and try to find a way to work through it. You know, so many people hear the word meaning and they think it's pouring pink paint on everything and pretending everything's fine. And the reality is 
to find the meaning, you have to go through the pain. And I also want to clarify, I saw it in the chat, when someone, um, when you hear this word, oh, finding meaning, you, you think, that's horrible. There's no meaning in a, a horrible cancer death or a husband dying or a parent or a child dying or a pandemic. And I always let people know, absolutely, I agree. The meaning is not in the horrific loss or the death. The meaning is in us. It's what we do after the loss. Thank you. We have a question about grief and hoarding. My father, who was a hoarder, died a year ago. Over his life, he suffered a series of serious losses. My first question is, do you think that grief can trigger a hoarding disorder? Secondly, do you have any reflections on the way that hoarding impacts the grieving process of the people left behind? Now that he has died, I'm having to get through the mountains of things he left, and I find this process emotionally difficult. Well, the first thing that I want to say is a disclaimer. I am far from a hoarding expert. So I don't think I really have an answer to the first part or the second part about hoarding. I do know that it is an illness of our mind also. So if you can treat it that this is an illness that your father had that was most likely out of his control and to go into that, you might do it with a little more compassion and to also understand he was many things besides a hoarder and to also see that those aspects of him too. I hope that helps. We have a question about learning or teaching people about death. I work with 14 to 18 year olds and we've started to discuss death in class. How can we best do this while being sensitive to any students who may have lost someone recently? I think it is important, you know, I mean, think about the things we all get taught in school and how we don't use many of them later. And learning about end of life and grief is important and people are going through it as children, as teenagers. So I think it's um, important to teach about it. I also think it's important to also, if the teacher's aware, to be able to take that student aside and say, I wanna give you a heads up. I know your mother, father, grandparent died recently. We're gonna be discussing this. I'm not gonna single you out, feel free to volunteer information, but just know it's completely okay if you just stay quiet um, and give them permission to be. I think sometimes, um, especially with teenagers, when you've had a loss, it reads to you as embarrassing. You don't wanna be different from your peers. So I just wanna make sure the teachers don't go, and I don't think they would, you know, Joey, we know your dad died. Tell us all about it. I don't think they would. It's just a caution. Mm, that's helpful. We've had a question about the impact of grief on pregnancy. My dear friend passed away four weeks ago. Her daughter is six months pregnant with her second baby. She is so worried about affecting her baby if she allows herself to feel her sadness and really grieve for her mom, who she is devastated to have lost. How does a pregnant mom grieve without the stress hormones affecting her unborn baby? I see that a little differently. I see it that to me, suppressing feelings is actually a little more stressful than allowing them to move through you. I would say releasing the sadness, feeling the feelings to me would be the healthiest thing because, you know, it's interesting. So many times we think, um, if I don't go to the counselor, if I don't go to the grief group, if I don't drive by the hospital, if I don't feel the feelings, they're not affecting me. And I always remind people, the feelings are in you. They're not in the therapist's office or at the hospital, they're in you. So those feelings of sadness of your loved one dying are in you, whether you express them or not, pregnant or not. So I personally think the healthiest thing was 
allow yourself to feel the sadness because then you're moving it out of your body. Mm -hmm. Just my thought. No, I think, and, and all the studies I've read suggest that repression creates stress in the body and can sort of have a real physical impact. So I think that makes perfect sense. And I do a lot of work with uh, Paul Denniston when I do retreats who does grief yoga. It can be such a gentle way to sort of figure out how to allow those feelings to go out of your body. People can find his work at griefyoga.com. And he studied with people like Bessel van der Kolk, who wrote the book, The Body Keeps Score. So he's a wonderful asset mm. to people in grief. Mm. And that sounds like a really nice, gentle way of trying to move grief, grief through the body in a way that would sort of support pregnancy as well. And you're just, you know, it's sort of like, wait, I'm feeling these feelings. Well, I don't even know the instructions for getting them out. So he goes through how to get rid of the what ifs, how to release the anger, how to release the sadness. So there, it's nice when there's postures and routines and he's all about, because I know someone who's pregnant or not a yoga person may be going, there's no way. But he often talks about, it's not about physical flexibility in grief yoga. It's more about emotional liberation and releasing those feelings. Mm, that sounds wonderful. Um, we have a question about grief, keeping grief in a comfort zone. This is from Phil. My wife, Helen, became ill at the end of 2019 with a serious heart attack and stroke. She fought for six months and I experienced anticipatory grief. I have been working through my lived experience of grief and believe strongly in all the positive strategies, dual process, working around my grief, continuing bonds, finding meaning. I talk a lot with others and share similar experiences and will continue to do this as I move forward. My question is, is it possible to keep our grief wrapped up in too much of a comfort zone so that it is a block to working through grief? You know, this is a good place to sort of bring in the, the discussion. Many people know my work from On Grief and Grieving with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. And we talked about the stages, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. And now I'm so honored that they allowed me to add a sixth stage meaning. But as Elizabeth taught, for anyone who's read our book literally on page one, um, those stages are not linear. Um, and I think to remember, grief is organic. It's a very messy thing. I mean, I've never, even as a grief specialist, I've never had a, um, a successful time making my grief neat. It comes out when I don't want it to. It shows up in places I don't want it to. Um, it comes in waves. It comes in storms and all those things. I often call them grief bursts. So I, I, I think whenever we find ourselves trying to stay in the comfort zone of grief, what if you just said, you know, I'm going to let the day be the day. I'm going to let the feelings be the feelings and just let them out and see what comes out. Hmm. Thank you. We have a question about reoccurring dreams. I've, I've actually seen a couple of these. This first one, which I think relates to the second is, I keep having the same recurring dream, looking for my husband and finding him living in the country where he was born. However, he doesn't remember me being his wife due to having amnesia. Why am I having these reoccurring dreams? It's been over 10 years since he was killed in a road accident. And um, the other question that, that came in, which is related is just, is there a way to navigate nightmares after loss? All right, it's really two different big questions. So let me start with the dreams. You know, no one can interpret your dreams, but you. So I would say one of the things to really do is to go, what does it mean? What does it mean to me that he's living somewhere else? What does it mean to me? Is that a belief I have of the afterlife? He's living somewhere else. Does it mean when we're in the afterlife, we're no longer aware of the pain on earth? Maybe that's the amnesia. I mean, it's not even my place to guess or do the interpreting. What I will say that I find fascinating 
And as I mentioned, people in grief have been my teachers for years. Here's just an important thing they've taught me about dreams. One, there's the people who get the dreams and then there's the people who like, why aren't I dreaming? I want a dream, I want that connection. Um, I have found one of the ways to help with dreams is to sometimes look at a photo album before bed. Uh, that works for some people. Some people might find it too sad. So you have to, you know, take whatever I say that works for you, leave the rest. Um, the other thing is if you think about it, what's the one thing we can't do in a dream? We can't die. You know, if you've had one of those dreams where you're falling off a building, all of a sudden you're about to hit the ground and you wake up. You can't die in your own dreams. Here's the fascinating thing people in grief have taught me over the years. When they're with their loved one in the dream, if they say, oh my gosh, I just can't believe you're gone. I can't believe you died. The person suddenly disappears or you wake up. So people in grief have told me over the years to sort of put it in your subconscious. If you have a dream with your loved one, never tell them they died because they will disappear or you will wake up. I have no idea why that works. It seems like it's been true from what people have told me. So it's just an interesting thing to know. The second question was about nightmares. You know, all grief does not have trauma, but all trauma has grief. And so if you're dealing with nightmares, it could be your mind trying to process the trauma, it could be just processing the grief. So it's good to talk about those nightmares. It's good to talk about those images because we do need to get it out. I, I often tell people, you know, cause we deal with horrific images, sometimes the way our loved ones die. I tell people, you know, if you're in the first year, your mind is trying to find a way to integrate those horrible images. And it's normal for them to keep coming up. When you're moving to the second, third, fourth year, that's a time to really get support to help with those integrations if they're still, you know, re-traumatizing you. And by the way, I always talk about early grief for me. We talked about anticipatory grief, which is the grief before the death that Elizabeth and I talked about in on, in on grief and grieving. And then there's what I call early grief. And to me, early grief is the first two years of grief. And you know, if we went down to the local street and just ask random people, when's early grief? They might say, I don't know, first three days, first week, first month, first six months. People are shocked to realize early grief to me is the first two years. So just throwing that out there. We have a question now about keeping things after a death. My wife died very suddenly and unexpectedly two years ago. While I have given away most of her larger things, such as her sewing machine, I have left our bedroom exactly as it was, keeping her clothes, makeup and brush where she left them. Recently, my son said that he thought that this was unhealthy. Do you think he is right? I find being near her things comforting but I know that I'm still finding it hard to accept her death. I think there might be something there, but it's really for you to really think about, does those things bring you comfort, discomfort? Do they keep you in the past versus the present? So let me unpack that just a little. First of all, we have these wonderful new things, phones, that have cameras in them. You can take a picture of everything. You can photograph her makeup where it is. And you'll find when you look at a picture, you get the same emotional response if you kept her makeup brush right there. I also think it's important to think about the person who died. There was one man who shared with me how his wife had died unexpectedly in the bathroom. And he sort of kept the bathroom exactly as it was on that day. And when we talked about his wife, I said, tell me about your wife. And this was a couple of years later. 
And he told me about what an elegant woman she was and how she really cared about looking good. And I said to him, well, what would she say about this idea that a bathroom is a statement of her now? And it hit him. He's like, oh my gosh, she'd be horrified. She wouldn't want to be remembered by a bathroom. The same way, you know, is, is the best part of your wife that you can hold on to the makeup brush? I mean, she might go, oh my gosh, honey, that was for the background. Think of my heart, think of my love. You know, the makeup brush may not be the thing she would really want the connection around. And when you're ready, and there's no set time on this, when you can release them, you can find what does the makeup brush mean to you? Oh, it's how beautiful she was. Tuck the beauty in your heart and hold it there. You don't really need the makeup brush. You know, I often tell people, those things are evidence that our loved one was here. And no one wants to get rid of the physical evidence that our loved one was here on earth. But I remind people, you're the biggest piece of evidence that they were here. You're the memory keeper. You're the story keeper. You have it all. You're the piece of evidence. If you let go of the brush, my gosh, she's in your heart so much. She'll be fine there. Thank you. We have a question um, from someone. She writes or he writes. And by the I, way, I just also want yeah. to say, because there's such a um, talk out there about getting rid of things. And I just want people to know the only person who can decide when it's right to release things is the griever, the person in grief. No one should ever say to anyone, they do, but we don't have to listen to them. Don't get rid of that. Don't do, you know, get rid of that. I mean, look, I'll be the first to admit, after my son died, I put three bags of his clothing from his apartment in my car to go give away to the local thrift store. And my goodness, I got in my car the next day and the smell of him, there was no way I was letting them go. And there's one small bag of his clothes that I still have to this day, it's a few years later. So I wanna, you know, really tell people, find a way to hold on to what connects you to the person, make sure it reflects them, but don't let anyone tell you it's too late. You got to get rid of that. You got to do this stuff in your own time. Oh, that makes sense. And, and, and sometimes things can be really powerful ways of connecting us with the people who have died. But I, but I also like what you say about what is it you want to carry with you, you know, in your life as you move forward. Right. As, you know, it's part of that person. Is it the, you know, we might need some of the objects but are, are there also other ways that we can integrate them and, right. and hold them in our lives, which I think is important too. Right. So this question begins, I was in my first year at university when my dad died and I knew that people knew about it, but no one talked to me about it. I guess for fear that I would be upset, but it made me feel very alone. I feel strong connections with people who have lost a parent and it is a relief to be able to talk about it with people who understand. Do you have any advice about how to bring up the subject of death with people who have not experienced this? You know, the truth is, even if they tried, they can't understand. You know, when I'm with another bereaved parent, and we've both lost children. We've had children die. I don't know what it's like for them to have Susan, their daughter die. And they don't know what it's like for me to have David, my son die. So I think it's my younger son. I think it's a myth that we can convince other people or educate them enough to understand it. I mean, I'm a grief specialist. I fully didn't understand what it was like to be a bereaved parent until I was one. So I think we got to give our friends a little bit of slack, a little bit of room, knowing they don't understand it till they're there. The other thing that I think is really important, and it shouldn't be this way, but it is, and I 
big believer of living in reality. The truth on planet earth is we do have to educate our friends. We shouldn't have to, but we do. So I learned just a couple of tips. I learned things like when I go to a get together and maybe people haven't seen me in a while, my son is on my mind, I want them to know it's okay to talk about it. I might start out going, oh my gosh, I'm so glad to be here. So glad to see all of you and connect with you. You know, it's been such a challenging few years with the death of my son, David, and I name him and I say it. And then I go and being here with all of you, it's so good to be out and doing things. I let them know I'm out, I'm doing things. My son's name's David. I can talk about him. You could bring it up. And it just right off the bat lets them know they can mention it. And our friends think, oh, I don't want to upset you by mentioning your loved one has died because you look like you're fine and you forgot it. And I always tell people, we don't forget. It's okay to mention it. Can you say a little bit about the physical symptoms of grief? So the question is, is just you know, kind of exploring or outlining the physical symptoms that grief can make us feel. You know, I think it's so important that we look at the physical component. That's why like when I do retreats in the physical world or I've done them there um, in the UK and in Ireland, you know, there's always, uh, I'll do them with Paul to have the physical component. And I have learned it's so different for all of us. I, after many of my losses, I carry my physical pain in my back. Other people get headaches. Other people get stomach aches. Other people, it's in their shoulders. You know, obviously, we want people to get them checked out medically to make sure physically they're all right. And to also know grief is also in our body. And many times, if you become aware of that, you'll begin to sort of notice where you hold your grief in your body. That's really helpful. Uh, this is a question about searching for a lost loved one. I was bereaved eight months ago and I often feel a strong need to physically search for my lost loved one. I worry she is not safe and keep thinking she is out there somewhere waiting to be found. I don't know how to accept the reality and I worry this is not normal. It is normal. I actually wrote about it as finding meaning. I talk about when a loved one dies, it's like our GPS is going haywire. It's had years of finding them on the planet Earth. And then they've died and we can't find them. And there is exactly like you mentioned, this searching feeling that we have. I experienced it myself. So it is very normal and you are very early in your grief. So just know um, it's normal. That's lovely. There's some really nice comments coming up in the chat, by the way, some nice comments about your book, um, responses to what you've said. And there's a lovely um, comment from someone about being given a load of his father's clothes and actually wearing them and, you know, and, and the kind of comfort of having the clothes wrapped around him. And I just we, thought that was, was really lovely. So I wanted to share that. Right. Um, I have some of my yeah. son's shirts, same sort of thing, exactly that. And I think, you know, on those special days, sometimes that's a day it's nice to have an article of clothing or something around, you know, I think that's, um, that meant something to them and means something to you. I also see a comment I want to address about, is it helpful visiting a grave? You know, a grave, it's such a personal thing. I love going to a grave. My older son does not go to his brother's grave. He's like, that's not where he is. I think it's so deeply personal. So I think, you know, whether you're the person who connects at a grave is really up to you. There's no right or wrong to it. Um, there's a whole nother world that happens at graveyards. So for some it's right, for others it's not. You know, our grief is as unique as our fingerprint. We all do it so differently. 
Do you think, here's a question, that there's a value in crying? Some people cry in grief, whereas some don't. So I wondered if this impacts the processing of their grief. All right, I'm gonna give you some information here you're gonna find interesting. First of all, the belief for me is, if you've got a thousand tears to cry, you can't stop at 299. Crying is such a healthy, wonderful thing to do. We also live in a world, and I go into a lot of description in the book about this. Uh, we live in a world with people who are practical grievers. Practical grievers are the ones who like, you want to know how to grieve? You go to the funeral, you move on. That's life. And I, you know, those of us who are more feeling oriented, look at them and go, where's your feelings? Where's your tears? And they'll go, well, I cried at the funeral. What more do you want me to do? It's not going to bring them back. Feeling grievers tend to look at them and go, and even the feeling almost feels a little judgmental. I don't even like that word. But the people who express their feelings look at them and go, why aren't you feeling more? By the way, practical grievers look at us and go, my goodness, you're feeling too much. And I think it's important to understand there's not a right and wrong in this. There's just different styles of grieving. And some are very practical and some are very feeling oriented. There's, there's a related question about crying, but I think it, it's a little different. My daughter committed suicide last February, 2020. She was 22, leaving her two sons, age one and two. I can't grieve, I very rarely cry. I used to get drunk to cry, but I can't anymore. I'm blocked, is this normal? So, I mean, this is an interesting question because I suppose you get the sense that here, the person writing really feels that they need and want to cry, but are, they're having difficulty. Yeah, it's interesting. I was going to go one place and then I switched and I'll even tell you my process. My process was first going to go, there's a healthy denial we go to. When we're in a survival mode, suddenly you're raising kids, you're dealing with life. Sometimes there isn't tons of room for all the feelings and you don't even make a decision. Your psyche puts the grief on a shelf to come down at a later time. And when it comes down, it's not because you avoided it. You were just in survival mode. But then when she went on to say, I use alcohol and all that, then I was like, oh, there might be an active avoidance factor. So I would say this, grief does not need a lot of time, but it needs dedicated time. And so if you can find something that'll work for you to give little bite-sized things. I've seen people who have said, I'm going to take a walk for five minutes, listen to their songs. That's my grief time. Other people have said, my shower is my crying time. It's interesting in uh, one of my online groups, we do videos every week. And in the teaching video, I make them like five, 10 and 15 minutes, really bite size. Cause I think we have this image of, I've got to give up 20 hours of my day for grief. And no, you just got to give a little to it each day. Doesn't need a lot, but it needs dedicated time. You can't multitask grief. Mm -hmm. You have to give it time, yeah, to, to breathe and to be focused on. We have a question about friends. Is it normal to cut certain people off or out of your life after loss? How do I push away the resentment I feel for how some of my friends disappeared despite knowing how I was feeling? I'm a 25 year old who lost her dad just over two months ago after a five year battle with, with lung disease. I have felt isolated having a sick parent for so long and now having lost him, I feel like I can connect to strangers more than my friends. Thank you for sharing that. And so sorry for the loss of your father. You know, what you're discovering is I think what a lot of people in grief discover, that our friends just don't understand it. They don't know how to react to us. And it's been so smart of you to seek out people who do understand grief. 
people who are in grief have been gathering together forever because we know those are the people who get it. Your other 25 year old friends, and you also, you know, might think back to when you were 21 and 22 and you were carefree and your father was alive, you probably weren't thinking about it either. So just know your friends have their own fears, have their own issues. It's probably not about you. They just don't know how to do it. And you absolutely can let them go. That's your right. And you can also educate them. You can also let them know, I need a little time to talk about my dad once in a while. I need some time to be sad. So you can educate them. And also, I always remind people, our friends play different notes. You know, and sometimes we need the whole orchestra. I have friends who are, I don't want to call them the superficial friends, but they're the ones that like, they want to just have a fun dinner in the newest restaurant and discuss the latest movie. And that's as deep as they go. I have other friends who, oh my gosh, they're ready and willing to talk about my deepest pain. And I have found over the years, I need all the sets of friends. I need the ones that just are the activities. They just want to walk. They just want to play tennis. So if you can look at these friends as all different types of friends and know there's no one friend who can be everything to us. It's really helpful, very wise. We have a question about celebrations while you're grieving. What are your thoughts on managing the duality of emotions during times of celebration? So moments of celebration that would usually be spent with the deceased loved one. How do you approach or handle this? Yeah, it's interesting. It also, it goes back to what we we're just talking about friends and family. Like I can remember a family gathering at a holiday a while back and one of the family members said, isn't it wonderful we're all together? And the person in grief was like, no, we're not all together. So how can we include the loss in that celebration? Is there, is there room at the wedding for an empty chair? Is there a candle that can be lit at the dinner table in honor of them? You know, I feel like we want to either do the full celebration or the full grief. And I'm always like, how could we do them together? Now also, let's say I'm going to a Christmas dinner or a holiday dinner and no one knows my son. They weren't part of my family or something or I'm going to a get together on a special day. I might make sure I go to um, the graveyard ahead of time and go spend some time with my son to really give my grief time to release the expectation that the people at the holiday or the celebration are going to attend to my grief. I try to attend to it first. That's lovely. And also someone said in the chat, you just put up a link for grief resources. They were wondering about online groups. And my group also besides those resources is also um, in the UK. I have lots of people from the UK and it's called Tender Hearts. You can find it at tenderhearts, plural, heartssupport.com. Tender Hearts with an S, support.com is there. And there's a free Facebook group I also have that many people in the UK are in. I'm looking at the time and I realize we're, we're, we're getting near the end. I thought for a final question, I would ask you this one, which would sort of tie us right back to the beginning. It's about finding meaning. What are the initial steps one can do to find meaning in grief and loss? Sure. And someone just asked about that uh, death by suicide link. It's suicidegrief.com. Suicidegrief.com. And by the way, we'll, we'll send you a follow-up with all these things in it. So you'll be able to have that. Um, I, I would say, you know, when we talk about this idea of finding meaning, you have to think of a few things. You have to understand that you need to feel the pain and release it. One of the things I studied in that book that surprised me was buffaloes. Buffaloes, you know, are in our Midwest and they sense a storm coming 
and they actually run directly into the storm, thereby minimizing the discomfort and how long they're in the discomfort. On the other hand, we tend to run from grief, which actually maximizes the time we're in the pain. So you have to allow yourself to go through the pain. The only way out of the pain is through the pain. And that means you gotta feel your feelings. You know, we can't heal what we don't feel. And then the other thing to realize meaning is a decision. Am I willing in my own time, in my own pace to find some meaning? And there's many ways to do it. We can change the outer world if your loved one died in a horrible way. Maybe you make the world a better place so that they don't die. Other people don't die in that way. Um, it can be, you know, little small meaningful moments. You know, this is a meaningful moment we're having to name it. You know, I talked about my son. You talked about your loved ones today. This was a meaningful moment we shared today. So the other thing is to know the decision is, am I going to allow myself to find meaning? Am I going to be willing to find meaning and live again at some point when I'm ready, a life that honors them? Not that forgets them, but honors them. And I think that's really so important. And another thing to add is to think about, you know, people often say, when my loved one died, a part of me died with them. And I'll say that's true. And a part of them lives on in you. Meaning is nurturing that part of them that lives on in you. Is it their generosity? Is it their kindness? Is it their sense of humor? All those things are different in a million other ways we can find meaning. That's really wonderful. Um, I think that really leaves us out of time. Um, we've had some really lovely comments coming in, a lot of thank yous and goodbye. Um, this has been a really wonderful, warm and wise session. We always appreciate you talking to us about both your personal and your professional experiences and sharing your wisdom with us. Thanks. Well, thank you, thank good grief. And I appreciate all of you there doing this. And I look forward to doing more things with you in the future. And thank all of you for sharing your love and losses with us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, and bye for now.